The theme for this afternoon is the purpose of education, and I have three distinguished scholars to help me with this. So initially I'd like to make a few remarks and then we'll go from there. To start with, maybe I might give you a little bit about my own background because that involves the process of re-education in itself. In that, my basic background is in uh, technology, engineering and management. And I was involved in professions and a career for almost 30 years in that field in various capacities in terms of electronic, electromechanical manufacturing company. And then subsequently for the last 15 to 18 years is when I guess I would say that I went through a phase of re-education in that I had the opportunity to work at and with and in the Foundation for the Future in Bellevue, Washington that was endowed by my colleagues. And the theme or the mission of the foundation was to increase and diffuse knowledge concerning the future of humanity, a rather ambitious uh, charter. But in the process of doing so, personally, and again it might seem like I'm dropping names, but forgive me, but in the process of working through the different activities of the program, activities in the programs of the foundation that I was in charge of, I had the opportunity to personally interact with and have conversation with and learn from mostly eminent people like Ed Wilson, the creator of sociobiology, uh, Eric Chasen, who wrote the classic text that's used in every astronomy classroom about the epic of evolution, Fagan, Brian Fagan, who is one of the world's most famous cultural anthropologists who has written about 50 books talking about the anthropology, the cultural anthropology of various civilizations. I even had the opportunity to discuss memes with Richard Dawkins and uh, vital dust. In other words, the fact that we and the stars are made of the same stuff as originally scientifically established by Christian de Lu and his book subsequently called The Vital Dust. And then again, uh, New York University, these are among a few of the names, just to point out what kind of a variety that I had the opportunity and good fortune to interact with. And one of the others was Professor Michio Kaku, who is a string theorist at the University, New York University, who has written extensively about vision. And in the context of vision, discussing the fact that humans have to make a transition from type 0 to type 1 if we are to survive, and the distinction from type 0 to type 1 being how we harness the resources of the planet in terms of its energy needs, and then transition into the planetary system and how we go about colonizing it, if you wish. So given that, I've already talked about thinking about the future in terms of that complex matrix that I explained prior, where the three axes are the various political, cultural, economic, social systems that are on one axis, individuals in their multiple identities dealing with these systems or as being part of those systems operating within the larger environment of the planet insofar as all of the multiple spheres, the atmosphere, the geosphere, the zoosphere, the biosphere, and again taking the liberty of introducing, if, you, if I might, the context or the element of spiritual uh, aspect where Teilhard de Chardin describes it as the noosphere in his uh, classic book, The Phenomenon of Man, where rather than humans having descended from divinity, are uh, ascending toward divinity, uh, divinity in terms of what he describes as omega point. So now let's get right to the bottom of, or to the very basic of what I believe or what I think in a very elementary sense, the purpose of education is. Let me start there and then I'll try to fill in in so far as where we go from here. To me, the purpose of education is to essentially enable us to understand who we are, how are we related to everyone else in the planet, and all the other elements that we interact with on the planet, which is the biosphere, the geosphere, and so on with the specific objective of meeting needs. And again, not to oversimplify, but I simply chose to use Maslow 
in so far as articulating the hierarchy of needs that essentially determine what it is that we are pursuing by way of education or any other endeavor. And that hierarchy of needs starts with the physiological, then the safety needs, then the love needs, the esteem needs, and the self-actualization needs of humans. So in that sense, that is the hierarchy. So to what extent does education as we pursue it make us understand the relationships that I described and the objectives that we seek to meet, which is, to me, it's keeping it as simple as possible. Now, what has happened insofar as the nature and content of education in terms of what we see as of today? And so with that in mind, let me point out a couple of things. A lot has already been said about the fact that we have generated knowledge over the past within silos, whether it's physics or chemistry or biology or mathematics or calculus, whatever the subject might be, or social sciences or political science. But the fact of the matter, as he laments, is we have in a sense lost the Renaissance concept of education that used to exist, but then have made education subservient to the needs of a paradigm, which I will describe a little bit later, essentially where we have lost the concept of the unity of learning insofar as the complex interconnections between the various disciplines. As Ed Wilson points out, in education, the search for consilience is the way to renewing the clumbling structure of liberal arts. During the past 30 years, the ideal of the unity of learning, which the Renaissance and Enlightenment bequeathed to us, has been largely abandoned. Or Noam Chomsky, People have the idea that from childhood, young people have to be placed into a framework where they are going to follow orders. This is often quite explicit. So that basically has been the substance or the content of education at whatever level they might have been designed in order to implement. And if you want to put it that, put it in this way, essentially brainwashing to, subserve, to be subservient to the needs of whatever the entities might be that are dictating as to what needs to occur. And to that extent, what used to be in the old days, involuntary, uncompensated slavery, we have moved to education, meeting the needs of those that are interested in achieving objectives to voluntary paid slavery. In, to that extent, the exercise of our creative imaginations and our minds in so far as understanding other things have essentially been uh, shunted. And I'll say, I'll show you a little bit in a little bit later as to what uh, uh, Professor Wilson talks about in his rather famous book called Consilience. Consilience essentially meaning jumping together of the various disciplines of knowledge and, and, and the emotional passionate plea he makes for changing education to go back to that model of consilience as the basis of education. Now, one other thing that has happened in the process is insofar as recent times more exacerbated as to what I will describe as the closing of our minds. Closing of our minds insofar as being participants in society are the need for political correctness has required us to be able to think about, to talk about, and discuss things in certain, with some criteria in mind, and the, essentially they are uh, sort of described in the following, most of which, if you, if you think in terms of knowledge and hoping to attain knowledge, in the strict sense of the term, is stunted or obstructed even, or actually bypassed and even uh, nullified. And these are some of the principles that I'm sure you would recognize operationally in most of our societies now. One of them being the fundamental principle, which is those who know the truth should decide who is right. So if you are now in the clutches of a fundamentalist mind, whether it be of the religious kind or of the scientific kind or whatever kind, basically they tell you what the truth is and therefore they have the right to decide 
who is right. The second principle being the simple egalitarian principle, which is all sincere persons' beliefs have equal claims to respect, no matter how stupid their pronouncements about whatever the subject might be. As I think as you think back, you will see that in our own societies, a lot of this is operational and a very active and aggressive basis and getting worse by the day. So the, the radical egalitarian principle is similar to the egalitarian principle, but the beliefs of persons in historically oppressed classes or groups get special consideration. So objectivity, taking into account situations that currently exist are to be ignored, but historically oppressed groups have to be given special attention in terms of their proclamations about what they know or what they think is right and therefore respect that opinion no matter again how stupid that might be. And finally, the humanitarian principle which is any of the above with the condition that the first priority is to cause no hurt. Which is you cannot disagree with somebody for fear of emotionally or mentally upsetting their feelings to the point where if all you have to do is say something silly and they agree and you get along perfectly well. But ideally, the only principle that has actually generated and is relevant and valid for pursuing knowledge or education is the liberal principle, which is an aspect of which would be the scientific method, but essentially saying through public criticism, checking who is right by way of dialogue, in terms of uh, conversation, in terms of proof, in terms of evidence, and, and so on and so forth. So this is something to keep in mind when you observe a system of education to what extent these principles are dominating the discourse as it relates to how someone is educated. So, now, we have had a lot of conversation about paradigms. I am going to make an attempt to describe what I believe are four major paradigms that have been the basis around which or within which we have evolved, and that's the important point I want to make, within which we have evolved to the present. The first one is what I will call the divine creation paradigm. One thing I want to point out here is that none of these paradigms have been replaced by the succeeding one. It is simply each paradigm is overlaid by the succeeding paradigm and on and on to where we have now currently on the onset of the fourth paradigm that I will try to describe. The first being divine creation as the basis for how we get educated or we know what we know. For instance, for instance, some of the basic principles of this paradigm was that the earth is flat, that it's 6,000 years old, right? And that the earth, the, the, uh, the sun revolved around the earth and we know of great minds in the past who have been uh, either executed or put in jail for proclaiming the opposite. Well, slowly, in a sense, even though it has not gone away, some of the elements as in terms of these kinds of beliefs have been given up, but the basic divine creation paradigm is still very much in vogue, insofar as how we have come to be where we are, who created us and so on, and what the relationship between us and the divine and each other is. The second paradigm, which again overlays the first one, is what I will describe as the paradigm of evolution. Evolution insofar as it relates to the idea that it is a selection for fitness. And it's not just, it's not just in the realm of humans that the evolutionary paradigm has been operant, but by, by virtue of the fact that Again, I go back here to refer to Professor Chaisan, who has written this classic about the ethical revolution, where he describes seven major stages as it relates to the evolutionary paradigm. Of course, starting with the Big Bang, then the particular stage, the galactic stage, the stellar stage, the chemical stage, the biological stage, the cultural stage, and the last one that he has described, which puts us in today's context, which is the ethical evolution stage. So, 
what this represents basically is the fact that evolution has been at work from the beginning of the Big Bang as we so acknowledge. And it is entirely conceivable that without actually challenging, because you get into the question of what caused the Big Bang, ad infinitum regressively, so let us assume that for the moment, even though I personally am not willing to concede it, that the divine creation principle, as some are beginning to insist, still holds. And that divine creation principle is articulated in the form of what we now know today, presumably as a sign, is intelligent uh, creator. The intelligence principle meaning what we see around us in so far as structure and organization and hierarchy and perfection and interrelationship between the components are so perfect, are so good. For instance, the various parameters that hold this planet together are exactly of a certain uh, measurement to where any variation in that we wouldn't exist. And the idea being that intelligent, it represents intelligent design, therefore there must be an intelligent designer, which, depending on your inclination as to what faith you belong to, that is the God who is the intelligent designer. But I don't really want to get into the debate because there's a lot of debate about the, the hoax that this science of intelligent design is. It depends on who you talk to. The third paradigm, again, overlaid on the first two. Again, keep in mind that where we are at, situated in so far as humans on the planet as a species, is between cultural evolution and ethical evolution. Cultural evolution, again, essentially being manifested or represented by selection for fitness of means. Means being packets of ideas. As far as evolution is concerned, one thing to also keep in mind is that there is neither purpose nor direction in so far as strictly pure interpretations of this process. It is simply an outcome based on the success of a set of ideas that have managed to survive. So, in that sense, an example I often give is, if you go to any street corner in the world or any major city, you will find McDonald's, or Kentucky Fried Chicken, or Domino's Pizza. One would have to agree and acknowledge that it has been an exceptionally successful move. We may have all kinds of arguments and questions about whether it is good or bad, but the fact that it has survived and spread is in itself a representation of the success of that need. So now, insofar as <coughs> cultural evolution is concerned, in that stage has evolved what I would state or what has been described as the Baconian paradigm. I, re I referred to it a little while earlier. The Baconian paradigm essentially is an outcome of Francis Bacon, who articulated it. I don't know exactly when he lived. I'm sure Evo would be qualified to tell me as to exactly when he lived. Elizabeth, the, the age of Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And what were the basic postulates of the Baconian paradigm? First of all, recall, uh, recall that he was a scientist. And the power and impetus for the scientific method got its motivation from Francis Bacon and those around him. So one of the primary requirements of this paradigm was the use of science to understand the world around us. The second aspect of this was that it was required, whether by divine sanction or by our own motivation, that we need to understand the world around us via the scientific method. The third dictum of this paradigm was that the idea, the purpose behind having the science and knowing the world around us is for purposes of progress. Progress that is infinite, progress that is linear, and therefore absolutely essential that we pursue the notion of progress. We'll talk a little bit about what the consequences of this paradigm have been, insofar as what we face today. 
The fourth one, and this is where a lot of conversation is now taking place, is the idea that we are at a point in our evolution where we need to think in terms of what might seem like an oxymoron or a contradiction, which is conscious evolution. In other words, not denying the fact of evolving, but the fact that we as humans have an input to it. Conscious evolution. And here some of the principles of new science have become important and have come into play. Some of them being, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the popular book that Malcolm Gladwell wrote recently about tipping points. Another one is about self-organization, which is gaining a lot of currency. To give you a small example of what I mean by self-organization, take a multi-lane highway. Essentially, all we know is that there are lanes on either side of the, tra of the traffic, and cars by the thousands on that road, but nobody is dictating exactly how one gets to their destination in so far as making decisions instantly as to which lane you should be in or whether you should stop or whether you should accelerate. Other than the boundary within which you are functioning, it is almost exactly an exercise in self-organization where an individual motivated by the need to get somewhere gets there by virtue of being on that highway, making conscious choices on an instantaneous basis, but the traffic in its entirety gets organized by itself. The third principle that we are beginning to get to is the idea that, as who pointed that out, yes, I believe it was Evo, is that, or I think actually Gary, where we have been in the operating under the assumption that everything is linear. But actually, almost everything we know around us is non-linear. Insofar as, for instance, the most famous example given is about the butterfly that flaps its wings and you see a tornado, in an exaggerated sense to illustrate the point, you see a tornado at some distant point in time which cannot be predicted, you don't know what the impact of it is, but where it will occur, but eventually a butterfly flapping its wings creates the tornado at some point in time in the future. So when you look at these principles, maybe what we can do as I tried to explain in my earlier comments, as to how the future actually comes about. If I have time, maybe I'll try and quickly go through this. Imagine a flat surface, any one of these flat surfaces, and temporarily I'm kind of going to uh, create a circumstance where what you put on that flat table, sur flat surface, sticks to it even though initially, because of the flatness of the surface and whatever the smoothness of it is, whatever is put on it may slip off or fall, and let's allow for that too. So now visualize seven billion human beings, soon to be nine, nine point five, and some say 12, as these grains of sand that are providing inputs to that flat surface. At, as I described, different locations, different identities, operating under the influence of different systems. So if you were to take the geography of that flat surface and imagine multiple points of inputs of grains of sand to that flat surface, depending upon the rate at which that input is occurring and the variations as to conditions and at each of those locations, you will see critical masses emerging as to the contour of a pile all over the flat surface. And if the process were to continue ad infinitum, what you end up then is two neighboring contours merge. And if you take the thought, thought experiment to its ultimate end, it eventually creates a single pile. So the idea of the future, now going back to what I've been trying to say is to think of individual inputs as a flat inputs to, as grains of sand to a flat uh -huh. surface 
creating contours and localities, merging into neighboring localities, and eventually emerging in some form as to a final contour, which is the outcome of our original input. So when we think in terms of human, humans and the purpose of education, let me share a few thoughts along the same lines. So here is uh, Henry Morris, essentially talking about the fact that there are fluctuations, there are dynamics, there is rhythms, there are patterns, and all of that kind of interconnected in a, in a, in a complex sense to create the outcomes that we see. And, and, kind of, and then this is another important, I've had the personal uh, wonderful experience of meeting Professor James Lovelock and his book Gaia, basically talking about the fact that the planet is an operating system with fine-tuned in parts interacting with each other and our part in it is one not above and above, over and above it. And so recognizing this might be the underlying basis for an education that will help us cure our ills. Here is something that the old sages used to tell us all the time, but we, have, we seem to have forgotten, is the fact that we are not apart from nature, but belong to it, and we are one with it. And again, Alan Watts, where he's basically discounting the fact that the world is not a set of binaries, but it's much more complex than that. Good can exist with evil, pain and pleasure, not all. And this is again uh, John Barrow, another famous physicist, talking about the fact that we it's a totality, it's holistic, and that a lot of the Eastern philosophies had these ideas centuries, if not thousands of years ago. It's not that they were misguided, as we used to think, but maybe premature. Because if we were to think in terms of consilience, coming back to education, here is a diagram that Professor Wilson draws about, we were discussing this earlier, as to whether when we think in terms of the sciences that we pursue today, the silos individually are environmental, ethics, biology, and social science, but in terms of addressing real issues, you cannot separate them in those silos, rather you have to think in terms of them as complex interacting phenomena that we need to have some understanding about if we are to be successful in addressing these issues. So again, coming back to the very basic idea that we are thinking in terms of education for the future would require the acknowledgement that we need two basic requirements, two basic things. One is humans need to think in terms of a planetary identity and secondly, ethical evolution. Ethical in the sense, and we'll get to that in a minute, and here we mentioned all these earlier, the balancing between the individual and the collective, which Gary pointed out, and also the fact that we are part and parcel of a complex system around us, which is the atmosphere, the biosphere, the geosphere, the zoosphere, and the noosphere. So the purpose of education need not be, at least as far as not the knowledge aspect, I'm not discounting what that this applies to mathematics or physics or chemistry, but at its simplest level, the purpose of education going forward has to be the idea that we are planetary citizens, no longer uh, can survive with narrow identities that relate to geographies or history or culture or politics or society. And a second aspect, and I'll close with that, my colleague, who is a far-sighted uh, uh, physicist and a thinker, used to constantly point out that humans today are the equivalent of going in a car, traveling in a car at rapid speeds down a slope without steering, without brakes, without a, a headlights. And unless we stop and think in terms of how we are going to get control of that situation, we may not even survive. 
And the second example is given by Professor Calvin, who also is an evolutionary biologist at the University of Washington, who basically uses the analogy of, again, humans in, a, in a, some kind of a vehicle, where the headlights that are there on that vehicle and the speed at which we are moving are totally out of sync, where the light, the distance that the headlight is throwing is not adequate to deal with the rapidity with which we are going down that slope. And you may call me a pessimist, but at this point, I think based on what I have understood, a lot of these scientists that I have, or, or minds that I have uh, have had the wonderful opportunity of dealing with have basically pointed out in so many respects that climate change or water as a critical resource or the exhaustion of fossil fuel or the destruction of the ecosystem or the exhaustion of all the other resources, uh, climate change, all these are consequences of our, how do I put it, blind following of the paradigm of progress in a linear sense that I just described. Gary did a wonderful job. I was going to use that also in terms of GDP as a measure of progress. It's probably the most distorted measurement that one could use. And there is a wonderful book, if you are interested, called The Third Curve, written by a gentleman who is, used to be a filmmaker, who talks about the fact that financial capital has been the basis on which we have determined everything going forward in terms of decisions. But one needs to take into account that, as again Gary pointed out, not only is financial capital uh, important, but we have cultural capital, we have social capital, we have human capital, we have resource capital, and we have ecosystem capital, all of which are being depleted at the expense motivated by financial capital as the only measure of progress. And finally, I would warn us that ed unless education is reoriented towards this notion of planetary identity and citizenship and ethical evolution going forward as it relates to our obligations to future generations, it is a well-known principle in evolution that 99.9% .9 of all that ever existed is extinct. And right now, scientists are describing, at least in the last several weeks I've already read, that we now are actively in the sixth stage of mass extinction. And humans are not exempt. Thank you. You mentioned a voluntary paid slavery. I mean, I thought that was very useful to remind us that we are voluntary based slavery and the closing of our mind. Um, just a few comments. You, you mentioned that uh, 30 years ago uh, we lost the unity of learning. And, and I believe that something around 1970, between the 70s and to the 80s, we've, we've lost quite a lot. We've lost gold as a base for the US dollar. And we lost growth to enter a field of growth has been fueled by death. So we've lost lots of things in the 70s and the 80s, and we pay the bill right here, right now. Um, our currency has no value. Our educational system has lost the unity of learning, as you said, and I think this is absolutely awful. Um, I just wanted to go back to a few points that were to be explored in the topics landmark, like what are the main social objectives education serves in society today? And what are the main learning objectives of education today? I really loved your, your presentation because it's the purpose of education that we can foresee. But what do we have today? I believe that education is a purposeless system. If we go back to why we have universities, it's just because there were monasteries and theological education, and the trade men wanted to be able to have their own way of educating people without the religion. So it's an opportunistic element. 
there has never been any purpose to serve the society. It's an opportunistic reaction to a power. And there has never been any purpose in any system besides maintaining the power of one group of people to another group of people. So that's one comment. This is a purposeless, a posteriori system. And it becomes a standardizing process to maintain that power. And for me, education is the best cultural Trojan force that ever existed. Because you format kids to a way that they will conform in a system that is exactly designed to maintain a power in place. So what are the values that a system wants to make sure you keep? Or basics? Conformity. Ranking, you know? Because if you start ranking people, you compare them and you make 99% of the guys really ashamed. They are losers. And 1% are the winners. Does that sound familiar with any criticism of the capitalist society? It's 1%, 99%? Because the 1% became the teachers of the future 99%. So it's really a system that keeps surviving and surviving and surviving. And honestly, when is the best time ever in education? It's just when it stops. You know? It's like end of June, beginning of July, and everybody can, everybody can burn everything. That's the best time in education. The rest of it is a torture. It's a real torture, which has a single point, which is accepting life as a suffering. And there are many other traditions that refuse that life is a suffering. And instead of maximizing profit, there are other ways to think and to say, no, we have to minimize suffering. So instead of having a purposeless system that is just evolving for the sake of 1%, torturing the 99%, promoting obeisance, conformity, and standardization of thinking, why can't we think of something else? Something that would make us happy, healthy, creative. And I'd like to stop here. Uh, uh, education should be the development of the individual personality in the social context. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the social context may be derived from needs, as you mentioned now, huh? But I think it's also produced. We have many uh, needs. We are uh, uh, seeing now, for, uh, for example, in the consumption, they are produced. It's not our needs to have internally. They are produced. But what is more important is what uh, do I mean by individual personality? I think it's... Uh, out of three components, one is thinking, the next one is emotions, and the third one, the will. A person exists uh, of these three dimensions, and all together can be uh, called its the wisdom. We discussed already this morning. So, uh, education should enhance the wisdom of the whole personality. Uh, the second point is the general learning objective to arrive at the development of a personality uh, should recur to the classical uh, enlightenment. Uh, classical enlightenment uh, begins already with Bacon and to refer to the French uh, uh, parallel theory from Descartes. You know, this is just linear. But I think this kind of enlightenment doesn't help much, but we have many other enlightenment theories, beginning from the Scottish enlightenment to the French enlightenment. I remember we have already spoken about Smith, Locke, Hoppes, 
in France, uh, Voltaire, Rousseau, and uh, many others, and uh, I may add also the uh, theory of Immanuel Kant in the German-speaking area. And for those people, reason was the central argument for the development of the personality. So it's the thinking mainly and the rationality in the sense of uh, um, of the reason, enlightened reason, which was the promotion to develop an individual personality. I think this is uh, uh, very important uh, if we want to develop a paradigm or something of a paradigm to connect it with this older series in the second uh, part of the nine, uh, uh, 17th century and uh, uh, beginning and until the 19th century. Uh, because in my view, I think we should not build some theory without relying on this enlightenment theories. Uh, it certainly, they have certainly been in, uh, to be enriched by modern theories, which I do not know so uh, much uh, than the Enlightenment theories. But a few years ago, we had a conference in Podgorica, and there were very interesting contributions to the uh, uh, aspects of modern, sea, of modern society which modify in a certain way the classic Enlightenment theories. Uh, the next point is education should be a process, and this is what we call as the lifelong learning. Uh, growingly important are the educations at the uh, very early uh, years until the aged people. And uh, we have, for example, in the European Union conceptually five stages for the development of a person and to keep them uh, according to the needs, their needs and the needs of the society educated until uh, very old, uh, they are very old, until 75, there is still the, uh, the latest stage of uh, the life le uh, learning circle. And I think uh, this uh, should also be uh, uh, taken into account, uh, the experience especially with this adult education, uh, which could uh, contribute the, uh, to the development of some kind of paradigm or things like this. Finally, education uh, has to be human-centered. It has been said already uh, uh, many times here in this uh, morning. And I think uh, Gary has contributed already to uh, an important extent to develop uh, some kind of human-centered education concept. But I will refer also to Amatya Sen, mm. you know, the theory of capability, which in my view is, um, especially from the view of in, from the economic system, it's uh, really a good uh, composition because he has three kind of uh, educational activities where the capability should be developed. It's the social context, it's the working context, and it's also political context. For example, democracy is a very important value, and I think this should take, uh, be taken uh, into account and may enrich what I have uh, at the beginning defined of the development of the individual personality in the social context. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, first, I would like to start my comments by, by saying my gratefulness, uh, to leave my gratefulness to all of you here, 
and uh, me as business professor, uh, and also uh, a, a business professor who is going through sort of change or paradigm myself in my particular, you know, the, the functional area of study. And I, I, I view this, you know, you know, change and paradigm shift in my career, and also for the, for the general in academia, it's very critical, uh, in my view. So, so as, a, as a business professor, it has been a very, uh, I mean, valuable learning opportunity myself, and also uh, learning from the, this, uh, the, the, the uh, colleagues like you from this MNU uh, Association. Uh, going back to my own uh, study, field of management, within UN community, there is a newly uh, emerging secretariat called UN PRME, and PRME stands for Principles for Responsible Management Education. And more than 600 business schools worldwide joined this new sort of movement in, in, in terms of the new, new paradigm of management education. And within this kind of uh, the, the organization, from my experience with this movement for the last five or six years, sort of I experienced you know, the, those issues that we, we discussed today. So once again, I'm very, uh, this has been a wonderful uh, learning opportunity myself. And my comments on this uh, session, I especially like this, 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 this session because it was about purpose. Purposefulness in our calling education. And I think I'm not denying the uh, freedom of academy, I, I mean, uh, the scholarship and so on and so forth, but when, as we are moving into this new dimension, and this, this new dimension of uh, education, where, as, as, as Professor uh, Fernand Moore mentioned, uh, conscious evolution is sort of regarded as a very uh, critical dimension of that, that evolution. So, as we are moving into this new dimension, maybe purposefulness might be the very starting point. Especially, that is especially so when it comes to the change management issue. You know, the change man management issue uh, is the uh, very important subject subject in the in, 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 in today's business, today's management. Okay. And, and, and when it comes to the change management, uh, for those, uh, if you take a look at the company cases and so on and so forth, those so-called purpose-driven companies are more likely to manage the, the change in in successful manner. So, if, if we are talking about this paradigm shift in education and learning, maybe it's a very good starting point to talk about purpose. What is purpose of education? And, and going back to the greatness of having purpose, purpose will ignite the human members within the organization or within the system. And purpose will give you with uh, some creative solution. And, 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 and with this uh, new paradigm change management, we may go through ups and downs and uncertainty and so on and so forth. But having this purpose will, go, will make you go through all this uh, the, uh, uncertainty. So, so uh, I think uh, having purpose and talking about this purposefulness in education is, uh, is, 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 a, is a good idea. And my comments will be short too. And, and my so the question to, to this session might be then uh, the uh, uh, from my from my own experience as a business uh, professor uh, with, with with this uh, in conjunction with this UN PRME movement, uh, the, the experience that I had so far is that not many professors share this the necessity of have of having this purposefulness in, in their education. Maybe that's because of compartmentalization of the knowledge and so on and so forth. And again, as we are moving to from knowledge to wisdom kind of level, then uh, we, we need to have uh, to, 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 to have this purpose in the education process and learning process. Then my question is, uh, what do you think? I mean, what might be the reason and or uh, 
the, uh, the, the, the way to move forward with the, uh, making this, uh, the community of learning education uh, moving into the purpose driven uh, the town. Who would you like to answer that question? Thank you all of us. All of us. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Part of the reason is, as you pointed out, is when you operate completely closed in within a system, then you tend to be unaware of what's happening outside. In that sense, insofar as consequences of the current paradigm in operation, one can directly point to the fact that every one of the symptoms that we are now looking at by way of what threatens us as a species on the planet is a direct consequence of this paradigm that we are blindly following within our silos, whether it is in business or whether it is uh, geopolitical affairs or whether it is dealing with culture or whatever the aspect might be. So the whole purpose has to be, and I think maybe one of the things that a conference like this might attempt is to connect the consequences with the, with the nature and the content of the paradigm that we are following to where nobody then can be suicidal enough to say, oh, that's fine, let me continue with it. So it's awareness and breaking down, you know, of the, of the, of the big concrete structure that is around us insofar as what we are operating within and the consequences that we are creating. Uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, read the world famous classic essay called The Tragedies of the Commons. Mm. And I think The Tragedies of the Commons is a perfect manifestation of operating within our domains totally oblivious to what is being thrown out into the area of the commons that nobody is responsible for, as of now, yes. Great session and uh, great comments. Uh, I would only want to address, uh, you mentioned uh, Alan Watts. Uh, I, uh, Alan you Watts. mentioned it, uh, I studied with him. Uh, oh, he's he a house group in Sassolito. Right, right. okay. And I learned uh, from him uh, a precious uh, concept uh, that I think uh, would be relevant uh, to the purpose of education. One of the phenomena that you were addressing, uh, you know, that bring us uh, to the brink of catastrophe is uh, that uh, we are compulsively dependent on truth, on uh, security, on, uh, you know, getting uh, control. And, uh, Alger was uh, always insisting and even wrote a book about uh, the security of insecurity. I think uh, that uh, to be obsessed uh, with getting the truth and uh, getting uh, the right formula to change uh, for the better society brings us uh, to a lot of problems, uh, including uh, you know, to be you know, addicted to control, which actually provoke the opposite uh, because we cannot control and we simplify and we make things uh, far, far different than they are in reality, you know, whatever we think, uh, there is a gravity, you know, whatever we have uh, ideas about the world, uh, we have not resigned, uh, that uh, we might take, uh, you know, different approach, uh, one is about surfing uh, insecurity, meaning uh, that uh, if you are too rigid or you, know, you want to have it too much, uh, you actually squeeze it out, uh, not the, you know, grasp it. And mm. uh, that book, uh, The Security of Insecurity, <laughs> I would recommend it as, uh, you know, from high school on. Uh, I, I, I give it to my postgrad students uh, okay. in uh, psychotherapy because also the field of mental health uh, you know, it's been obsessed about understanding the truth and hurting people quite a deal in that regard. So I would say that uh, serving uh, reality with a little bit more humility and uh, also maybe we would have uh, less need of denial because, uh, you know, we are so obsessed uh, of getting it, then uh, we feel impotent in front of some uh, phenomena and then we deny it. See, uh, for years, uh, uh, you know, 
climate warming, and so right. forth. The yeah. security of the insecurity. I was going to show one slide, if you can turn that around, that reflects your sentiment perfectly. It's from our great physicist Subramanian Chandrasekhar. And let me see if I can get to it. It's about Icarus. Okay, so... <coughs> let us see how high we can fly before the sun melts the wax in our wings. Any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Sash, and all the panelists for very thought-provoking comments. Uh, it's raised a number of points in my mind and some questions. I'll just go through a few of them. Uh, you started off with that uh, wonderful comment from Ed Wilson about the unity of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this comes back to some of the other topics that we're going to discuss, like contextual knowledge and so mm -hmm. forth. But I'm not quite sure I made the connection here between his comment, which I fully agree with, and purpose of education. Mm -hmm. uh, and if maybe I missed the point if you uh, wanted to connect it. I like very much your comments on the paradigms. Uh, and you went a little quickly, or I was a little slow, but uh, I thought uh, that the, and I might be speaking correctly, but I thought you were distinguishing between the, set, the third and the fourth paradigm. Uh, the one you call cultural evolution and conscious evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I've taken it this way, that the cultural evolution represents more the effort to adapt us to the needs of society, mm -hmm. whereas the conscious, which is not a question of being conscious, it's a question of imitation or conformity. Uh, and the conscious evolution implies we need a different paradigm in which we are consciously questioning, right. thinking for ourselves, and mm -hmm. taking creative choices. Right. And this is uh, very appropriate to asking ourselves what's the purpose of education. I started off this morning saying, looking at, cult at education as an instrument for social evolution. Mm -hmm. And in saying that without elaborating on it, uh, I think that there are two dimensions to social evolution. There's no doubt that society wants to preserve itself, and it does that by trying to pass on those essential knowledge or skills or values or behaviors that are in conformity with its survival. There's also education to help solve our problems and move us forward. Some of our scholars described it as thriver. As? Thriver. Thriver. As opposed to survival. Ah, good, okay. Uh, I think this comes back to the question we were discussing this morning about a theory of change. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and what is the role of the individual in that change, and what is the role of the society in that change? We had two sessions in this room last fall, one on the individual, one on collective and looking at their interactions mm -hmm. creatively. So it makes me think that if I was going to try to answer what's the purpose, the big question, what's the purpose of education, that it would be the to promote the evolution of the society through the fullest development of the potentials of the individual. Because in fact, what we discussed last August here was all progress of the collective comes through creative progress of individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's true, or in the measure that's true, rather, it would be really interesting for us to look at the existing system of education, which certainly does a lot of what I would call as a psychologists would call social conditioning. Uh, it does a lot to pass on the mean. Yes. It does relatively very little to create the conditions for that conscious evolution. 
And I think that's a nice way to think about the kind of paradigm shift that we may be talking about. It's not that passing on the meme has no value, because if we have to, if we have to each of us learn to drive on the right side of the street uh, fresh, uh, that's, a, that's a dangerous world for us. But we know that's not going to solve our problems and help us at all. So uh, I thank you all for your comments. Let me comment on the like question you raised about the confusion as to cultural evolution and conscious evolution. I didn't mean to create that confusion. What I was trying to say was that the four different paradigms, the one preceding conscious evolution was what I forgot to mention, scientific humanism as the basis of the paradigm within which you know we operated with Baconian ideas about progress and what it means to be successful and so on. Cultural evolution uh, is simply, I was describing it as one of the stages in the seven parts of evolution, uh, stages of evolution, and more appropriately, conscious evolution and the ethical part of the evolutionary process is what I would associate together. I hope I clarified that. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, um, drawing much out of your comments. And, uh, that was the idea, that this is the beginning, not the end. Yeah. <laughs> You're mentioning the term of uh, the need for planetary consciousness. And I would guess that 95% um, of professors on this planet who are dealing with uh, the future would admit that this is necessary. I'm sorry? Really? Would admit that this is necessary, yes. the planetary consciousness. How do you think you're going to get there beyond simply saying we need more education? Uh, okay. Very concrete. Two, two, two quick responses. One is, as we were discussing a little while earlier, and this is the pessimistic one, which is that we will head towards a collapse and react. The prognostications are uh, quite, uh, how do I put, uh, predominant that that's really what's going to happen because evolutionarily we are not hardwired to anticipate those kinds of uh, quantum jumps in thinking about who we are. But the other part of it is, again, a thought experiment. Suppose, for instance, that we were to create a circumstance where we say a hostile alien power is ready to strike us. What do you suppose we would do as humans on the planet? Run. <laughs> Run or unite to fight. <laughs> so, so the question is, how do you, how do you create a circumstance where that alien hostile threat you don't really need because all the threats we currently face are orders of magnitude more serious than any likelihood of a hostile threat. It may not happen at all. I, I agree with you. So I am somewhat of a cynic in the sense that we are headed towards a collapse. My question was somewhat uh, different. Um, Assuming that we need um, a planetary, yeah, if we stay in the conversation, the, the mic picks up everything. Uh, assuming that we need a kind of a universal or global gravity of consciousness in order to cope with the challenges at hand, mm -hmm. okay, despite any aliens entering or despite any other constraints, how do you want to get there? How do you want to get there? How do you want to get there? global gravity of consciousness. Beyond just simply quoting, we need more education. I agree with you. But yes, it's not an easy easy proposition at all. But there are some examples where in a, in a smaller sense, those kinds of things have already happened. Uh, one of them being two ladies, two women, got together and created the circumstances for the mining, of, I mean, for the uh, eradication of landmines. 
and I believe now there is a UN charter, if I'm not uh, mistaken, about the fact that landmines are illegal. So, uh, I guess the other possibility is we sit and contemplate our navels. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm somewhat reluctant uh, for actually entering the discussion now because it's, what I want to say is very different from uh, what all of you have been saying during this, uh, uh, this session, and uh, yet uh, the title is actually the only one that we have that comes uh, together, that comes uh, as close as I think to an important question which uh, we may otherwise miss. One of the purposes of education now, based on the fact that when we look at the unemployment data, is if people have higher education, they have lower employment, they have higher employment possibilities. So one of the purposes of education is definitely employment. And uh, uh, what we have also now is that basically, uh, as a matter of fact, Gary and I, in about two weeks, are going to meet with people at ILO. ILO is the oldest of the UN-type organizations, and they are faced with a very huge problem of a very large number of unemployed people. Uh, it would have been normal that everybody who gets uh, a degree at university, at any level, as a matter of fact, we went through the Bologna uh, process, explicitly in the aim that those after three years of education could be employed and work and in the process of working get master in the process of working get mm -hmm. PhD and so on and so on. Now we don't have that as a matter of fact many young people uh, have no uh, solid basis of a job once they are done. I remember when I was a professor at the University of California I had three jobs Job number one was to teach, job number two was to do research, and job number three was to get a job of those of my PhD students who got a PhD with me and those of my postdoctorals to get them a new job. Now, of course, this is sort of disappearing, so we almost speak as if uh, uh, we are not facing the immediate consequence, and the immediate consequence is huge unemployment. As a matter of fact, uh, in the recent poll of the European Union, the number one threat is considered to be the unemployment. Number two is the economic difficulties, number three is the immigrant, now maybe this is pushing up, mm -hmm. and only number whatever, ten or something like that, is the war among the stupid powers or the terrorism or something like that. In the Club of Rome, you know, uh, two of our fellows, uh, Mircea Malica and Orio, wrote, uh, Orio Cervini, wrote a book, uh, a report to the Club of Rome, called The Double Helix, uh, The Education and, uh, and Employment. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I am not mistaken, the second report to the Club of Rome was, which came as a matter of fact, as a, in a way, as almost to relieve the, the pressure of limits uh, to, to growth, it was there is no limits to learning. Uh, so uh, these things are things that uh, I would like to see as an immediate reaction. Uh, we do need, and we have responsibility, and the university, in my opinion, has the responsibility of employing the people because is not the existing economy that should say what they need, because everything is changing so fast, okay. is the university people that should tell, these are the people that should really be employed, and we are educating them. Otherwise, we are just, you know, uh, uh, making useless things for of the young people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, yes. No, I was just going to say, in Spain, over 50% of the university graduates have no jobs today. Right. So the question I would have, those are daunting statistics, but one comment, one question for you, uh, is, 
if you were to allow for any and all possibility, will you ever be able to create a set of circumstances for full employment? We do or believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. That, that they can. Because I'm thinking about two countries, India and China, yeah. where the, the, the level of official employment, maybe Janani can help me here, is they say 10% unemployment or whatever the number is, but the number is four, five, six times higher than what they say the number is. And I'm sure the same is the case with China. Most of the, the majority of people who have educations at whatever levels in those two countries, at least in India I'm aware of, is they are self-employed and that self-employed takes the form of a corner tea store. Anyway. Well, first, um, I want to say that uh, this morning, I mean, when you started with this uh, six graders yes. story, I was very much encouraged to uh, build up on that, uh, especially because people that I have a very interesting role so about education and leadership, education for leadership, or maybe we should now start talking about leadership for education. But anyway, uh, well, the key precondition for us to be, let's say, Today from now in line is to be very critically and carefully uh, participating in this session and the next one is about legends because otherwise right. I mean this is very much connected. So I want to clarify for myself, I mean some 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 things that I heard from you know, and connecting to your to this morning intervention. Uh, we have a uh, all boss and consistence, they have a saying, which is probably consistence from all over the world. And give me the kid, and freeze him at an early age, give me the kid, he or she is 10 years old, and then you can do with him whatever you want. Uh, which means actually that uh, we are focusing rightly to the higher education, I think, but I think we should a little bit more connect with something which is happening. Before. Uh, in Haggadah, which is a very famous paper in Syria because we kept one of the oldest Haggadah during the war, uh, which was in the 4th century, it was a very famous saying that says, I have learned much from my teachers and from my colleagues more than from my teachers and from my students more than from all of them together. Okay? It looks like we keep forgetting probably it was written a long time ago. I mean, but uh, I think we should somehow go back to that way of thinking. Why is it asking about it? Because the, the purpose of education, yeah, of course, there's a lot of that. There are two keywords. One is uh, uh, competence in something. Another one is character. Mm -hmm. okay. And we are, I think, focusing too much on competences and not enough. so much on character. Now, since we, some of us, a significant portion of us, are fellows of the World Academy of Art and Science, and the founding fathers did not form an academy because they wanted to group together and make more powerful bond. They got together in order to do, because they were not lucky but then they realized that the human, <coughs> human character may, let's say, do something bad with it. Now, finally, one of our colleagues, I mean, he was even quoted today, in, in one of his books about global wealth and things like that, uh, he has a very interesting quote by saying that we are living today in a, in a very bizarre, in a time which is a bizarre combination of Stone Age uh, emotions, medieval age beliefs, and almost that like technologies. Mm -hmm. I think this is the, yes. one of the core problems. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, we're talking about education, and we are getting better, faster, 
uh, interaction of higher quality of tools, technologies, or whatever you want to do. But yeah, that's why I was very encouraged when I saw in your in your model that this uh, educational evolution, uh, ethical evolution, is the key, key exactly. thing and the goal and tool of education. So I would like to clarify for myself, so I don't get out of the box in two days from now when we start talking about leadership and things like that. Am I right? That we should focus much, much more about educating characters because education is, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm so, so, you saw that. Education is, of course, about teaching you how to make a living. But that's right, but at the same time, it is how to live, live. <laughs> and not how to live yourself. And that's how to live your family, and that's how to live in the time where you are alive. So in that context, I think that we should a little bit uh, pay more attention, or at least put a footnote that we will on the characters and on uh, as you were saying, in our life, right? Because all this technology, everything is just support for the substantial life, which is easy in life. And we are going, I mean, in completely wrong direction. Not us today here, but I mean, obviously, the, the, the world is going in, 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 in an unknown direction. Yep. And it looks like it's not that you have too many drivers. It looks like nobody drives. There is no driver. <laughs> There's no nobody yeah. driving. Uh, Kerry and you, we have two minutes. So. Okay, sorry. It's thank you for that. And thank you for the, the discussion so far. I mean, it's such a complex field. And I've got one observation. I wonder whether we're going to get to a purpose for education, and rather if we recognize that education is um, a function of and a practice within a democratic society. So what we need to have is uh, better mechanisms for debating the multiple purposes of education. So the question of where the public fora should be to have this conversation would be one that I would ask. And I ask it again, very mindfully, of, of the people that aren't in this room, and also because actually quite a lot of issues around gender are going through my head mm -hmm. at the moment, but I won't express it. Um, but I also want to flag that there are, there are two people that I think are particularly useful in this debate that we've not mentioned. The first is um, the Dutch philosopher of education, Wolfgang Fiesta, who argues that the purposes of education are qualifications and the ability to learn to do something useful, Socialization, the ability to live in society, and subjectification, subject, which is the, the, the development of the self and agents yeah. in society. Um, and the other person that I think is incredibly useful who I skimmed over this morning is Margaret Archer, whose work has been looking at the relationship between individual and society and the mode of reflexivity we need. And her argument, in the, it's, a, it's a really long, thorough study that I won't go into, but her core point is that at the moment, as the world is changing rapidly, the only thing that you have to hold a coherent identity around is precisely a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes to the, how do we enable people to develop life projects? So again, rather than this notion of the never ending search for the singular purpose of education that we can all get behind, my question is how do we continue to have a much more lively debate about the multiple purposes of education that we might want to develop and enable individuals to develop those as a for them. Yes. Yes. And I will try uh, to respond, but any of you can respond. Since uh, Zlot will jump the gun, <laughs> not rating on the event there, I, I'd like to follow the point uh, Zlot will raise the, about the drivers. I, I do think we have drivers, okay? Uh, we have drivers who are supposed to drive, and these are the leaders of the business the leaders of the political life, the, the leaders of the parliamentarian segment of the, of the society, and, and I could continue. They are shying away from, from, from driving right. us in, yes, we acknowledge, it's a dice trade. Yeah. So it's, it's full of problems, and wherever you look, 
there is a there is a there is a huge uh, danger, and, and the speed and the curve is, is not matching each other. If you go back to real life, any driver will have to spend at least a couple of weeks, if not months, to obtain a driver's license. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that this is existing in, in the real world. So yeah. people are, are sitting on the top of billions or tens of billions of, 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 uh, of risk and others leading nations or segments of, of nations and there's no driver license. Well, I should go like a taxi driver in London. Let's understand, uh, at least three years probably, uh, the, the license to be obtained to, to master the streets of, of London. So, business. Yes, uh, they have an amazing uh, my track record of education, but we have to apply education to a new situation, and the new situation for me is the contingency uh, type of situation. In, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. we will have to make a transition. So education will have to be applied to this situation and carried to the leaders who are supposed to drive. Mm -hmm. So each and every member who is elected to the parliament, as an obligatory education course, you have to go through certain <coughs> curricula. And it, of course, it will be a, a big question who and, and on which basis defines it. Business leaders, you mentioned yeah. the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's, let's, let's have something which is leading us to my obsession, the, the, the negative externalities. There is a need to, to walk through uh, the, the business leaders in, a, in, in the area where they are, if they are in the chemical industry or, or if, if they are in the, in the other segments, what are the tragedies of the common they might create as a, as a result of uh, running certain activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the level of the politicians, uh, there are certain, uh, yeah, there are certain, how, how I should say, the, the law of gravity. Nations are drawn back again and again to conflict-like situations which they are not ready to resolve by, by cooperation. So I think we have to apply education to, 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 to the elite practically in a new, innovative way. It's easy to say it might sound naive, but we will not have the drivers uh, right. not shying away from them. Uh, if I might integrate both comments, I think I would agree with you completely, Kerry, that within the framework of a democracy, the idea of a purpose of education, uh, it goes back to that fifth principle that I was describing in so far as what keeps our minds open. And in response to your comment about educating the elites, I think one thing that I have observed works is a bottom-up pressure in so far as if the a democratic process is successful in terms of articulating the challenges and what education ought to be and a community of cons a consensus within the community is generated they have been and I personally think likely to succeed far more effectively than a top-down insistence on the elites being educated. We have seen for example we call it conversation cafes, where ordinary street people walk in, sit down, and have a conversation about whether it's climate change or what needs to happen with education and so on. If there was some form of concerted effort to generate a consensus that is a bottom-up process, you can apply pressure all the way across as to what the purpose needs to be. Can I come back? So one of the things that's always astonished me is that although we have museums, okay, museums are sites of public yes. discussion, or insights. So we have museums of science, of engineering, of buttons, of pencils. We do not have a functioning museum of education. education. We've got museums of schooling, but we don't have museums of education anywhere in the world. Okay. This strikes me as something that this group could think about. Brilliant idea. Construct a sense of impression, because then that educates both elites. Because any new minister of education, any teacher would have to go to that, and they would have to realize that these conversations would be going on a long time, that there are precedents, that there are different ways of doing things internationally. We lack a public education strategy for education, and what fills the gap 
is the PISA results. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what fills the gap in this grassroots discussion about education is how well is our country doing compared to that country on this incredibly narrow set of scores. So there is a huge public debate, desire to have a conversation about education, but it is dominated right. by these entirely undemocratic and intellectually incoherent analyses. <laughs> like this group, you mean? <laughs> so, you know, you need a different set of metrics Absolutely. and different public spaces to have this conversation. I think this might be something that WAS might undertake, is among its members assign responsibilities for generating some ideas bottom up in terms of what the purpose of education ought to be. But those ideas have already been generated bottom up. We have to network together with the people outside other groups. So That's what I'm talking about. No, no, not about members within the group. Yeah. I'm talking about with the outside the yeah, general so, community. Yeah. Just as a first step. Yeah. Build something from the bottom. Okay. With that, we conclude the session, and thank you all. Thank you.